morning. Blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless, bless you in the name, name of the Lord. Lord. Thank you. We're in our study on minor prophets. And of course, we are studying in the book of Micah. And we will end Micah today. Yes, we will end Micah today. <laughs> no matter how long it takes. Micah chapter 7, <clears throat> which means next week we start the book of Joel. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to okay. that. That's going to be a, a great study. But last week, we looked at the indictment of the Lord, where it was almost like a court trial where the indictment's given, but uh, Judah, Jerusalem are given a chance to say, you know, what, what's your charge against the Lord? Why, why have you got, uh, what have you got against the Lord? Why you're not obeying Him? Why, you, why you're not serving Him with full heart? And of course, there was no reason. The Lord has done, had done so much to bless them. <clears throat> so today we finish up, and the main theme for the whole chapter is wait for the salvation, or for the God of salvation. Wait for the God of salvation. All right? But it starts off with Jerusalem's lament. And when I say Jerusalem's lament, I know, that's... I don't know why, I see why it does it now. I get my pointer over a little too far and it does the, the whole opposite side. But while we're talking about Jerusalem's lament here, Jerusalem is personified as the innocent city in the hands of evil men. Okay? So it's Hebrew poetry once again, but it's like Jerusalem is speaking, the city of Jerusalem. So what is happening here? Verses 1 through 7, Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned. There is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. So what happens at the end of summer? Harvest is done. There's nothing left. Right? And that's what Jerusalem is saying. Because Jerusalem is going to be attacked by the Babylonians. Uh, it's going to survive. Okay? But we haven't really gotten that far yet. It's going to survive. But it's going to be a terrible terrible siege and I believe it lasts for three years before finally the Lord takes care of the problem and Jerusalem is spared but you can understand there's no food women are selling their children women are selling the placenta the afterbirth pigeon dung is being sold to eat it's just Terrible things are happening to Jerusalem. Verse 2, the godly has perished from the earth. Well, that's what it seems like, right? And there is no upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood, and each hunts the other with a net. And, and I think this speaks to where Edom has come up and has taken captives. Uh, to sell into slavery, Phoenicia, Philistia, all these nations have, ta have carried off people, and they'd gladly take the people of Jerusalem too, wouldn't they? Verse 3, their hands are on what is evil, to do, its, to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe, and of course at that time, <laughs> it if, if somebody's stealing from you and you go to the 
judge, hey, he's stealing from me. Well, hey, there's nothing to eat, but you give me something to eat and I'll rule in your favor. You don't have anything, but the person who stole from you at least has what they stole from you. I'll take the bribe from them. There's no hope, it doesn't seem like. The great and the great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. And uh, what's the old adage? If if you're attacked by a bear, you're and your buddy, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your buddy. That's the way it is. All I have to do is persevere over all these worthless people out here. If I can just get enough to survive, you know, oppress the poor to the point where there are no more poor left and then I'll have to deal with it. But as long as there are people there that I can uh, beg, borrow, and steal from, that makes sense, then I'm going to do it because that's how they are. Verse 4, the best of them is like a briar. The most upright of them, a thorn hedge. Oh, wow. Oh, what, <coughs> what does that tell us? Just in poetic sense. What's that saying in, in poetry? pieces but it's worthless isn't it to, to a degree it's worthless the only thing it's good is for a hedge like to keep the cattle in or the sheep in or whatever uh, but there's there's nothing growing in it and even if you want to pick blackberries or raspberries or wild strawberries boy you got to watch out for the thorns don't you The day of your watchman, of your punishment, has come. Now their confusion is at hand. So the watchman, what was the job of the watchman? Watch for the danger. Watch for the approaching enemy and warn everybody. So that day has come, but that day is the day of punishment. And what what's the attitude of the watchmen? And basically the rulers of the people too? You're not there, huh? No, what does it say there? The confusion is the man. Pardon? That there's confusion. Confusion. Chaos. Who's in control here? No, no one's in control now. Yeah, look at how uh, when when Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington, do you recall what song they made the British musicians play? I see what it is. I think it's the, uh, the what is it, the British? The Star Spangled Man. Mm -hmm. That wasn't until 1812 yeah. that that came. The world turned upside down. The world was turned upside down when the British Empire was destroyed, or beaten for the first time, the, the greatest army, greatest military power in the world was defeated. Okay? The world turned upside down. What's this? Confusion. What happened to the world? 
the Lord is not going to let us be destroyed. We're Jerusalem. we got the temple. We're the Lord's people. But all is great. <laughs> yeah. Confusion. Their world is turned upside down. Verse 5. Put no trust in a neighbor. I, I, I can agree with that in a lot of ways. Have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. Don't even trust your wife. Wow. Verse 6. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Now, you have that in the New Testament, don't you? Jesus talked about that. What, and what was he talking about the, when he was talking about that? He was talking about the persecution of the church, but relative to, I believe, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And what happens? What happens if you're hungry? I mean, when you're hungry. You'll do anything. Not when you've missed a meal. When you've missed a week's worth of meals. You'll do about anything. What happens? You'll do about anything to get food on you. Yeah. You'll Would you steal, steal food from your parents? Some people. Would you everybody. steal food from your children? Some people are stealing food for your children. Yeah. Steal food for your children. From them. Would you eat your children? I couldn't do that. Well, we say that now, but some like, of them know. did. Yeah. And if you hadn't eaten for weeks, yeah. what would you do? Remember the daughter pass. I'll just fix a daughter party is what comes to mind. What what would you do? When S H T F. <laughs> oh, I got it. When the ship hits the fan. Oh, or when the ship hits the sand. Okay. But <laughs> that's a G version, you know? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. What 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 do you do? And boy. They've listened to those false prophets for so long. It's going to be all right. Not us. And they, they watched Judah from the north just slowly being destroyed like a locust plague. We'll talk about that in the book of Joel. Israel destroyed. Then here they come, here they come, here they come. Jerusalem, you're the last. No, oh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Verse 7, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. Who say, again, who's saying this? Micah. Micah, isn't it? No, no. Who's saying this? Look up here. Who's saying this? Remember what I said in the, in the beginning? Jerusalem. Jerusalem's lament. Jerusalem is saying this. But as for me, Jerusalem, I, Jerusalem, now, okay. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for, my, for the God of my salvation. Right? Wait for the God of salvation. My God will hear me. Who's Jerusalem? Is it the city to a degree, but who is Jerusalem personified? The people. people the true people of God, like the Israel of God. Very good. Very good. You're picking up on it. So, so, the lament part. What would you say? Okay. Um, let that one slip by. Just like, just like that. 
Jerusalem is the city of God deserved better. Right? Built by God. You could say that even though it was built by people. It was built by God. The temple was there. It was God's footstool. It deserved better. Better what? Better rulers? Better leading people? Better than the destruction it was going to face? It just deserved better. But Jerusalem must be cleansed. It had to be cleansed. Cleansed of what? Cleansed of its idolatry. Cleansed of its immorality. <laughs> cleansed of its lack of ethics and how they dealt with one another. Trying to be like the nations around them. It had to be cleansed. So what you have here is the classic death, burial, and resurrection story. Right? Jerusalem's going to basically die, but in the burial process, all this terrible stuff's happening, but there's going to be a resurrection. Now, we're talking about the ex. We're talking about Hezekiah's repentance that brings them back. Are we talking about the exile after? Oh, I'm. I'm sorry. I said Babylonian earlier. It's the Assyrians who attack at the time of uh, Hezekiah. So are we talking about the Assyrians being defeated? Jerusalem spared. Are we talking about a hundred and some years later with the Babylonians where Jerusalem is completely destroyed. They go into exile, 70 years later come back. Or are we talking Messianic and talking about the new Jerusalem and the church? Well, you just have to pick. But Jerusalem will suffer, but Jerusalem will wait for future salvation. I think it has more to do with the messianic overtones. Yes, it's true. Dual fulfillment of prophecy can be there for Jerusalem in all three accounts. But A.D. 70, it's wiped out. Yes, there's a Jerusalem over there today, but it's nothing like it was before because the temple's gone. And it's not the holy city of God anymore. Follow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions? I did it again. finished with Jerusalem. I told you, I believe it had messianic overtones about the death, burial, resurrection. Now we get into the messianic hope. Alright. Uh, 8 through 10. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, when I fall I shall rise. Again, who's speaking? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord. Why? Until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me, he will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. You, you can understand that then 
messianically how the, what did Christ do? When Christ came, he went to the Jews. What did he do? He offered repentance. Well, even John did. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Bringing them out. Charge them. Get them to repent. Restore them. Renew them in what? The kingdom. The new Jerusalem. All right? Uh, verse 10. Then... My enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? And that's what all this destruction. We're, we're trusting in the Lord to save us. You're getting beat down. Where, where's your God now? And even for the Jews at the time of Jesus, and then up to AD 70, they still trusted in the temple. They still trusted in the Lord to save them. But what have they done to the Lord? They crucified Him. They wouldn't believe in Him. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. I think this is Jerusalem, the, the Jerusalem that has repented and died, was buried with Christ, and has risen looking at the old Jerusalem that was then buried in the mire in AD 70 when the Romans destroyed it. All right, so physical Mount Zion and Jerusalem will be exalted as the earthly place where the Lord will establish the new covenant, but both will give way to the heavenly Zion and Jerusalem as the throne and dwelling place of the Lord. So you, again, you see that death, burial, and a resurrection. When does it come? Truly, it, it's not it's not fully under. It's not fully manifested at the time of Hezekiah. It's not even fully manifested at the time of uh, return from Babylonian exile. But it is fully manifested at the time of the Christ <coughs> coming. Makes sense. You make that connection there. All right, so verses 11 through 13. A day for the building of your walls. In that day, the boundary shall be far extended. In that day, they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt, from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea and, mount, and from mountain to mountain, but the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. Now that's kind of, again, well, that looks like the coming back from the Babylonian captivity and, and really the Assyrian captivity, but I, I think what it's, again, I think it's again messianic because you're taking, <coughs> the Lord in his judgment is taken, it, it hasn't happened yet with Micah in Micah's time, but it's coming very soon that the northern kingdom is going to be destroyed by Assyria. They're going to be carried away. Assyria is going to attack the south and going to come down. People are going to be carried away from sea to sea. But there's going to come a time when the inverse happens, when they come back to Jerusalem. They don't even have to leave to come back to Jerusalem. Now, with the, bab after, with the 
with the return from Babylonian exile, they do come back to Jerusalem to reestablish the temple. But again, that's to fulfill that prophecy in the book of Malachi, which comes later, that the Christ or the Messiah must come to his temple. The temple had to be rebuilt so he could come to his temple. And once that's completed, see, Malachi speaks about it, and then that's the end of prophecy for 400 years. All right. But today, they don't have to come back to physical Jerusalem. They can come to New Jerusalem from everywhere. So the inverse sequence, the land will be temporary, will temporarily be desolate, but the walls rebuilt. But the walls, notice the walls. The boundary shall be far extended. How far? How far are the walls extended of New Jerusalem? It's worldwide. And even those who have gone on <laughs> are in the kingdom. New Jerusalem will be a dwelling place for people from all nations. The borders of New Jerusalem will be established. <laughs> there are borders. Do you know what the borders are? Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. One body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in you all and through you all, above you all. Those seven things are the borders of the kingdom, <coughs> the new Jerusalem. That's why they can be so broad out there and yet be what? So shall we say strict at least at least you know that the walls are there there are boundaries not to be crossed all right verses 14 through 17 getting to the the Christ himself shepherd your people with your staff the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land, let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. The nation shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn and dread to who? The Lord our God. And they shall be in fear of you. The ones, the people that are being shepherded, shepherded, led by the shepherd. Okay? So break it down. Romans 8.37. What does that say? We are more than conquerors. Right? You got it? Mm -hmm. What's it say? More than conquerors. It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Who loved us. Who is shepherding us, right? Mm -hmm. All right. How can you be more than conquerors? He is what? The Savior 
And if we are a part of him, we're more than conquerors. We are small s saviors. How are we small s saviors? We're supposed to spread the gospel to others. Go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be what? Saved. Saved. More than conquerors. Doing the Lord's work. Saving people. Now, that doesn't mean we say, but we're in the process, that part of the process where people can make themselves uh, uh, or bring themselves to salvation. It's Christ who saves. And that's an important part of it. But more than conquerors, say, Micah 7 14, his rod and his staff are what? The completed scriptures. Uh, uh, Psalm uh, 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But what gives us comfort today? The scriptures, right? Micah 7 15, the people, the Lord's people will have a new start. What do we call that? A new birth, right? Conversion. Uh, verse 16, the Gentiles will be astonished by the resurrection. What? He was raised from the dead? Yes. And go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and look at all the witnesses there. And for those in the first century, Paul says uh, uh, he, he was seen of 500 at one time and most of them are still alive. You can go back and ask them themselves. And last of all, I saw him. Paul says, I saw him. <coughs> I don't know who would want to call Paul a liar. Uh -huh. uh, Micah 7, 17a, the Gentiles will humble themselves and flood the kingdom of God. How long did it take before the church was more Gentile than Jew? within 40 years. Then after that, how long was it before the, the church made up most of the Roman Empire? Then the Roman Empire decided, we'll make it the church of the state, and then the state takes over, and you have the apostasy. And maybe that's one of the things that was bad about Jerusalem, because the temple was there, and the king's throne was there, when you put church and state together, then you've got a problem. And maybe that's why our founding fathers said there needs to be a separation between church and state. Don't let us don't don't have a state religion. Just thinking. Uh -huh. But uh, the last part of verse 17, the church will honor the saints of the old covenant. Okay, where are you? Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Because you're not the scripture. matching the scripture in Micah. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going well, to I'm give a reference to... I got you. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Kind of the wrong. last part of 17, <laughs> they shall come trembling, trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn and dread to the Lord's God. They shall be in fear okay. of you. But... Uh, I think the idea there is they will honor the saints of the Old Covenant, the ones who went through this stuff. Like Micah, later like Hezekiah and Isaiah, uh, as Isaiah is prophesying to Hezekiah, hey, be strong, we'll get through this, the Lord's going to protect you. Hebrews chapter 11, what's that called? The honor roll of faith. What's it about? Those Old Testament saints. Are they honored by us in the church? Well, they should be. Yeah. So, and they shall be in fear. Or how about respect of you? We respect 
we honor those Old Testament saints because they <laughs> they did so much without knowing the full parameters of what was going to happen. Now we're on 18 through 20. God's steadfast love and compassion. And I think now we come back maybe to uh, Micah speaking. <clears throat> it's a different paragraph, at least in the English. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? There, See, I, I hadn't even realized that there's another place where it talks about in the Old Testament that their sins were just what? passed over. They, they weren't truly forgiven but passed over. But, yeah, <coughs> no other gods passed over transgression. So that would be when they sacrifice the animals then it's passing over the sin but it's not actually forgiven? Right. It's, it, it's like uh, I'll forgive you when you repent. And you really got to mean it. <laughs> a conditional thing. Right. All right. Yeah, because there had to be a death. Right? The wages of sin is death. There had to be a death. The animal sacrificed the death. They could see that death because life was in the blood. Right? But the Hebrew writer says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to remit sins. It had to be the blood of the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So that's when sin, that's when, all right, all those sins that were passed over, when those sacrifices were given uh, or made in faith, trusting faith in the Lord, and I suppose that even at times when the Lord forgave them without a sacrifice. It happens in the New Testament, doesn't it? There are times when Jesus will say to somebody, your sins are forgiven. And the Jews go crazy. Well, were they forgiven then or is it when he sheds his blood on the cross? Now that's an answer that we may not know until we get to there. I've always, Ask him. I've always wondered, you know, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, did that go back and save all those people that were before the new covenant? Right. But but when he says your sins are forgiven, was that an absolute there, or was that uh, transactional, based upon what he was going to do? Just like the ones who faithfully offered the sacrifices. That's still brewing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? Why a remnant? Because that's the only ones who faithfully obeyed him. Right? Faithfully offered the sacrifices. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He is steadfast love and he delights in it. So if they would repent and turn to him, yes, there's going to be a forgiveness in the sense that he's going to allow them to escape this punishment now, but later on there can be the full forgiveness. Verse 19, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. When will that happen? Well, that's going to be the Christ and His sacrifice. You will see that's when the Christ comes, right? You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham 
as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. How? By forgiving their sins on the cross, by making that perfect sacrifice for sins. That's totally messianic there, isn't it? Yes. So, God's steadfast love and compassion. Who is a God like you? That's, that's a rhetorical question. There just is none like the God of heaven. Uh, verse 19, the Lord Messiah will bring forgiveness of sins. And verse 20, the Lord will show himself faithful to those who are faithful. That's what is being said here. The Lord will show himself faithful to those who are faithful. Right? He's going to show himself faithful to those who are faithless also because he said to the faithless, you're coming under condemnation. And he's not going to relent in that. He's going to be faithful both ways to those who are faithful. What is it? Uh, was it C.S. Lewis? I think it was C.S. Lewis that said when it comes down to it, the judgment will be that he'll say, uh, oh, trying to think. Uh, your, your will be done. But he, he says to the faithful, my will be done, the unfaithful, your will be done. It's, it's kind of something like that. Uh, yeah. The ones who are going by their own will be cast into the fires of hell. The ones who have done his will will be shown his faithfulness in the forgiveness of sins. And that's what's being talked about in that La very last passage of Micah. That's Micah. It's a beautiful book. I'm not, I think it's hard to understand. I don't know that I've got everything completely under control. I've got questions in my mind about it but I try to keep it in the terms of bringing out that messianic, looking at the historical context, but knowing that there are messianic overtones to it that, that need to be seen. So do you have any questions? I just have a brief one. Refresh my memory about how much before Christ was this written? I, know I think it was about it. 730 years. Okay. Uh, and because when he... Let's look. I don't know... I'm sure you probably said in the beginning that my brain forgot. So... Yeah, we talked about it. In the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So that was somewhere between seven, like seven forty, down to six six ninety five. I think is what we said. Have to go back and look at it to be for sure. But but uh, because of some of the things that are in the text we kind of put it around 730 B.C. Before the destruction of the Northern Kingdom, even though the Northern Kingdom's not talked about, but that he's talking directly to the Southern Kingdom, and of course, that, that, that prophesying can come any time in there. It, it could be 721. But it, it doesn't seem like the northern kingdom has been 
destroyed yet. But that's that's my best guess. It's around that time. Okay. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you for your time. Class dismissed.